Good morning to you 830 worshipers. And I offer my words of welcome to those of you who will be viewing later at 11 o'clock here in the sanctuary and for those who will be uh, tuning in on YouTube at a location of your choice. Uh, if we have not met before, my name is Jim Connor, and uh, for the last 12 days I've had the privilege of serving as your executive pastor. I wanted to put ex-pastor on my name tag, but I thought that might be a self-fulfilling prophecy, so I changed my mind. <laughs> I am incredibly excited to serve with you and with the wonderful staff here at the First United Methodist of Georgetown. I have admired your rich history of mission, compassion, and justice ministries. I, I appreciate your sense of community and uh, that you are a family of faith that covers many, many generations. I'm grateful that this is a church that puts an emphasis on prayer. I've also been prayed over three times uh, so far this morning. Uh, which is why I have a little bit of a voice, uh, and uh, I trust you'll be praying this sermon will be over soon in about eight minutes. <laughs> Most of all, I celebrate your call to live out God's love everywhere you go, and I promise to join with you in living into that call. Last week, Yvonne began our Roots Recalculation series with her sermon, Stop. She focused on the story of the wise men in Matthew, and she reminded us that the wise men didn't actually go to the manger, that they found Jesus and Mary in a house. But she did leave out part of the story from a different version about a visit from doctors that did, play, did take place at the manger. And when the doctors came and they saw Jesus, they declared that he was in stable condition. For many decades, I have started my sermons with a little joke, and I guess that was too little. <laughs> so what is it we should do? Would you pray with me? Let now the words from my mouth and the meditations of our hearts and minds be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This second sermon in our series is focused on Jesus' own baptism as told in the Gospel of Luke, and the sign of the road that we chose to use was the yield sign. Now, a yield sign calls on the driver to do the following, to slow down, to stop when necessary, to defer to oncoming or intersecting traffic, and proceed when safe, and to stay aware of all oncoming, oncoming vehicles. Well, let's be honest, just like the stop sign, sometimes we uh, don't really like to yield either. Uh, we don't like to give up control, and some of us kind of like to make the decisions. We like to be in front, to be the leader of the pack. We want others to be more aware of us than perhaps we want to be aware of them. When he was about 30 years old, Jesus was baptized. We know virtually nothing about Jesus from the time he was born until he was 30, except for one story about an incident that, incident that took place when he was 12 and his parents took him to Jerusalem for the Passover. But the story of Jesus' ministry starts today, starts in this passage. As we hear a preacher by the name of John who happened to be Jesus' cousin, um, giving a very compelling message, a message to repent, to turn around, to devote yourself wholly to God, to walk into the waters and let the waters wash the old away and emerge a new person. John invited people to come into the river and be baptized. Now, the story is in all four Gospels, did, but did you ever wonder how the story got in all four Gospels? Because as I, I read the different stories, none of the disciples were there to see it and remember it. None of the Gospel writers. It's in there, I believe, because Jesus must have had reason to tell the disciples about it, and the story was passed along until finally Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John, Luke wrote it down. John's is a little different, as it always is. But the story's in there because it was important to Jesus. Can't you just imagine some of the disciples, some of the other followers of Jesus saying, now tell us how this, how this whole ministry thing started. And he probably said something like this. So there I was, standing in the crowd, listening to John, and I was filled with this sense of anxiety and anticipation and expectation, and I knew that I had to decide what I was going to do with the rest of my life. 
So I found myself walking into that river and asking John to baptize me. And he did. He pushed me under the water and pulled me up. And there I stood, a little embarrassed, water running down my face. And it was as if the sky opened and God's spirit, almost like a dove, came down. And I heard a voice saying to me, you are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. The beginning of Jesus' ministry started on that day as he grasped that power of love. The day he knew who he was, the day he recognized he had nothing to fear because God had called him by name, and that name was the beloved son. That's what happened to Jesus, standing in the water of the river. He knew he was a child of God, the beloved, and it freed him to love with abandon, to live out his life loving his friends, loving all the people, all of those who he touched. Now, there are several theological questions arising from Jesus' baptism. Why would Jesus need to be baptized? Why is it that John baptized Jesus instead of the other way around? And because there are only adult baptisms recorded in the New Testament, why do we baptize infants? And is baptism necessary for salvation? Now, each of those questions could prompt a whole sermon series, but this morning I'm going to try and answer them as succinctly as possible. So here goes. And in reverse order, the answers are no, why not, I'm not sure, and as an example for us. (laughs) Baptism is essentially something God does. God continually, graciously, unconditionally is made present to us in ways that can be touched, tasted, felt, seen, and heard. And no matter how much we like to be in control of things, when it comes to our salvation, that's God's work. Think about that yield sign again. We need to yield to God. We need to slow down to stop when necessary. We need to open ourselves to the path that God chooses to lead us on. The longer answer to the question, is baptism necessary for salvation? It's still no as an answer from my perspective. Unless you want to start imposing limits on how God works in the world. Unless you want to start limiting the times that God will forgive, the times that God will love, the times that God will turn the other cheek on our behalf and on the behalf of everyone else in our world. Baptism is about God's merciful grace to people who haven't earned it. And dear friends, if there's anything I've learned in 60 years, that's me. And I think it includes all of us too. In all of the gospel accounts describing the baptism of Jesus, one big question remains unanswered. Why was Jesus baptized? Did he need to be baptized? After all, John described his baptism as one of repentance and forgiveness of sins, but from all that we've learned throughout the years, uh, Jesus hadn't sinned, or at least we didn't think he had sinned. So what would he need to repent of? And what did, did he need to be forgiven for? Actually, when you think about it, Jesus actually didn't do baptisms. He never baptized a soul. Instead, Jesus yields to John submits to baptism himself, and he kneels in that mud and the muck and the mire. And so the story continues of Jesus, who was born in a manger, baptized in mud, one who eats with prostitutes and tax collectors, one who cries, prays, and sleeps in the garden, one who dies a painful, very human death. Quite simply, Jesus comes to be with us so we can grow to be like him. The Greek word for baptism means to dip, to immerse, to submerge, and there's my favorite, to saturate. Baptism is for all of us when God takes pleasure in saturating us with water, saturating us with grace, saturating us with blessings, saturating us with love. The promises of baptism, the words of grace, the loving action of God, the demand for lifelong response, are the same for each person baptized, for Jesus and for you and me. So at whatever age we enter those waters, we emerge rising from darkness to light, from loneliness to community, and we're still as fragile and dependent as a newborn baby. 
For many of us, it was done long before we were even aware of it. We were carried to the front of the church by parents, held in one of our parents' arms, and water is placed on our head. I called my mother yesterday to remind me of when it took place, where I was, who did it, and mom had to look in a book. For it was in September of 1959 in a little church, Normal Park at that time, it was a Methodist Episcopal church on the south side of Chicago. I was baptized by the district superintendent of the Southern District, Frank Countryman. Now I know I've seen pictures of the baptism, but I don't remember the pictures. I don't really remember a thing about it. And you wanna ask me about my boys' baptisms? Yeah, those I remember. And it was my father who did those baptisms. And I've had the incredible privilege of, of doing many, many baptisms, and most of them were children. And you know, I love the old liturgy when we baptize children. Dearly beloved, baptism is an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace through which grace we become partakers of his righteousness and heirs of life eternal. Do, do you remember those words? Our Lord expressly, expressly given to little children a special place among the ping, kingdom of God. We remember the words of our Lord, how he said, let the children come to me, do not hinder them, for to such as these belongs the kingdom. We ask questions of the parents, their faith questions. We ask what they believe. But we also ask them the questions about what they will do for their child, and it includes bringing them to the church so that they might be surrounded by the love that the church can pour over on not only the child, but them as well. We ask the parents to promise that uh, they'll keep the child coming to the church until the child, by the power of God, shall accept for themselves the gift of salvation and become a full and responsible member of Christ's holy church. Dear friends, in a nutshell, if you really want to ask what baptism is, baptism is initiated in, initiation into the church. You cannot be a member of a United Methodist Church. I'm not sure you can be a member of any Protestant church without being baptized or Roman Catholic Church. But for us on this day, when we remember Jesus' baptism, baptism is so much more than a conversation about membership. It's a conversation about being loved, about being forgiven, about yielding to God's direction in our lives. It is the beginning of the year, more or less, and uh, I'm not one who comes up with New Year's resolutions, but I used to come up with one word that I wanted to guide me each day, I haven't done that for a couple of years either, so I just wanted to try and be ready for my first sermon. <laughs> but baptism is, is such an important, important thing for all of us. We, we do baptism together. We, we rarely, rarely do private baptisms because baptism is a community event. It's an event when we're all reminded that we are all brothers and sisters, when we're reminded that we all need each other. I love the words from the end of the service when we as a congregation are asked to say, with God's help, we will so order our lives after the example of Christ that this child, surrounded by steadfast love, may be established in the faith and confirmed and strengthened in the way that leads to life eternal. Author Annie Lamott, uh, her return to Christian faith uh, was a very hard one, and it came after a very difficult and troubled life. She wrote in a powerful books, and, and she was interviewed about one of them, and she gave this incredible answer. She said, I never said I'm a good Christian. I just know that Jesus adores me, and only, only is as far away as his name. I said, hi, Lord, and he says, hello, darling. He loves me so much, he keeps a photo of me in his wallet. If I were the only person on earth, he still would have died for me. You know, I like that reminder that maybe God has a photo of me in a wallet or maybe on an iPhone. And, and yours is there too. I really do believe that. Jesus not only reveals to us who God is, Jesus reveals to us who we at our best can be. And while we can be compassionate and empathetic and kind without believing in Jesus, I believe those qualities come directly from God and that Jesus brings out the the best in me and in you too. The young Baptist minister's son had uh, 
attended a worship service where his father had immersed several adults. He was greatly interested in it. The next morning, he decided to practice that kind of baptism. And you guessed it, he took his three, three cats and went to the bathtub. <laughs> the youngest cat bore it very well, and so did the younger cat, but the old family tomcat rebelled. The tomcat struggled with the boy, clawed and tore his skin, and finally got away. With considerable effort, the boy finally caught that old tomcat and proceeded with the ceremony. But the cat acted worse than ever. Finally, after barely getting the cat splattered with water, he dropped him on the floor in disgust and said, fine, be a Methodist if you want to. <laughs> As a reminder, we don't baptize people Methodists or Lutherans or Roman Catholics or Presbyterians. We baptize People as children of God, as, as Christians, we baptize them into the family of faith we know as the church, the church universal. Baptism is about God's merciful grace to people who haven't earned it. It's about the way that God loves those who are unlovable. It's the way in which we participate with God and God's reaching out and embracing humanity. Paul told the bickering Corinthians, for in the one spirit we were all baptized into one body, to the Ephesians, he said, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. The church's unity is a, a gift, not our own achievement. And frankly, right now, it's not that much of an achievement for us. But how else could we explain such a diverse group of people coming together to worship? According to Paul, baptism is the great equalizer. All the distinctions that separate people on this earth through a race in baptism. And so in baptism we are forgiven and adopted into God's family as fellow heirs of God's covenant. We are baptized either as adults or as children. Children, when they are baptized, they, they have an opportunity to go through confirmation when they are older and confirmation is a chance for our young adults to answer for themselves those questions that were asked at their baptism. And confirmation is also a commissioning, just as an adult baptism is a commissioning. For baptism is not just a time to feel good about being reminded that we're God's children and that we're loved, that we're forgiven, and that uh, we have a, an incredibly large family of people who will keep looking over us and praying for us and nurturing us. And all those things are wonderful things. But it's also a commissioning. For every baptized Christian is a minister of Jesus Christ. Every baptized Christian is called into ministry. And at a church like the First United Methodist Church of Georgetown, what an incredible gift that is to this community. But it is that gift only when we are willing to use the gifts and graces that we've been given to make a difference. And not just here in this community, but, but throughout our county, throughout the state, throughout our country, throughout the world. We make a mistake if we believe that baptism is the beginning of a lifetime of perfect bliss. In the stories of Jesus' baptism, he goes from the baptized waters out into the wilderness where he is tempted. Have you been in the wilderness? Lucky for Jesus, although I think he might have done okay on his own, uh, he had the Spirit with him. Actually, the Spirit drove him to the wilderness, but it was Jesus and the Spirit facing the temptations. I remember many baptisms, many that I've done, because I asked the congregation to watch very carefully and listen very carefully, because the child who's being baptized will not remember that, and it's up to us to tell them that we were there, that we saw them, and that we pledged to support them with our faith and with our love. I uh, had a chance to go to the Holy Land a couple of years ago with a ch former church, First United Methodist of Mansfield. How many of you have been to the Holy Land? Okay. It's still there, and there's still trips. Um, and I waited a long, long time in my ministry before I decided that was something I wanted to do. Um, and I went as a bus captain. 
which wasn't necessarily something I wanted to do, um, but it got me there. And I had a chance to, to walk uh, into this little area um, that's the, one of the most pristine parts of River Jordan, which is anything but peaceful and beautiful. Yard Neat is the official site where people come to get baptized or to remember their baptisms. We rented baptismal robes and we changed in the locker room. The locker room was really near the gift shop. But there are different areas where you can sit with the group you came with and you can walk into the water. And I tell you, when I walked into the water and, and offered a little devotional and, and when people came forward to affirm their baptism, I was overwhelmed with the feeling of Gosh, you know, Jesus was here. Thousands upon thousands of people have also been here remembering or experiencing baptism, remembering their children of God. And they spoke different languages and they were different ages. Many of them had died by now, but it was just a profound, one of those aha moments when I, I said, this was the place that I needed to be at this time. Then a year later, I decided I should retire. <laughs> that my, my ordained ministry, my appointed ministry had ended. And so I yielded to that temptation. And then I got a, a note from a friend who said, I don't know if this retirement is taking, but I wonder if you would consider coming and joining me at an amazing church. And so I said, I'm willing to talk to you, Yvonne. Let's get together. I am so excited about what the future holds for all of us together. But we need to stay grounded. Grounded in a realization that uh, what we do best, we do together. We all have individual gifts and graces, but we are all equal in God's sight. We are all God's children. We are all loved. We will always be loved, and it won't always be easy. Sometimes our doubts will overwhelm us. A person who knew doubting quite well was a man that you might have heard of. His name was Martin Luther. And over the course of his life, he battled depression. He suffered great bouts of anxiety, and he had one after the other crises of faith, so severe that he doubted his own salvation at times. And so he placed a large plaque in his room with the words in Latin which translate, remember your baptism. Luther understood that the fact of his baptism was much stronger than any doubt or anxiety he might produce. It is said that Martin, because his bouts and depression were so severe, would repeat over and over and over, I am baptized, I am baptized. And so today, if you have been baptized, we're going to invite you forward so that you can remember that you were baptized and you can remember that God loves you. And if you're not baptized, we invite you to come forward and you too can have water on your head and be reminded you're a child of God and God loves you. Because for all of us, we've been gifted and graced by the wonderful example of Jesus, who came that we might not be separated, but that we might be united, who came that we might be loved, and who came that we might be in ministry together. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for all of the ways that you have been made known to us. We give thanks for the gift of water that refreshes, that cools, that gives life. We give you thanks for your love we know in so many ways, but most of all through the gift, for the gift of your Son. For it's always in his name that we pray. And all God's people said,